everyone should look out not only for his own interests, there it is, but also for the interests of others. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. How about I put it on the screen so you can see it? There we go. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men, and when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Heavenly Father, we just um, pray that you'll be with us tonight. We are just so grateful that we can gather as a group um, and worship your name corporately um, and be here and listen to your word. I just pray that you'll give me the words to speak. Uh, and that you'll open up the hearts and the ears of the students, uh, that they can hear what uh, you are teaching them through me, that um, uh, they will grasp um, what you are trying to uh, put in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So I want to start off with a little bit of a story. I want to tell you about my week a little bit. I was driving around the other day, and I thought, man, I'm kind of hungry. You guys get that? But not like hungry for like food, but for like, like a sweet tooth kind of a thing, you know? So I drove past this place right up the road, and they had this, um, this plastered all over their, their store. They had these donuts, and I thought, that sounds incredible. And all over their store, it said, you deserve a donut. You deserve a donut. I said, you know, that sounds pretty good. I do think I want a donut. So I went in there, got in line for a donut. And while I was in there, I was scrolling through my phone, trying to edit my uh, Christmas list for this year, and this ad came up. And I said, oh, LeBron, look at LeBron. I, I like LeBron, right? He's selling some beats. He's selling some beats. I, I can get behind that. I think I deserve some, some beats. I need a new headset. So that sounded pretty good. So anyway, I added that to my list, went on my day, had my donuts, I was driving home, and I thought, man, I'm getting kind of thirsty now that uh, I've had those donuts. So go home, open the fridge, pop one of these open, and it says right on the top, you deserve this. And I thought, you know, I have worked hard this week. I'm tired. I'm thirsty. I think I do deserve this. That sounds pretty good. You're right, Dr. Pepper. Okay, so I have to admit, none of that is true. None of that happened this week. Um, none of that happened. But you can see how these things could happen. You could see how these things could be true. So... Through all these advertisements, and let me tell you, there are many, many more advertisements. We can clearly see that the, wor the world is teaching us to live by putting ourselves first. You deserve that, right? You deserve it. You worked hard. Uh, take care of yourself. You're hungry? Take a break. Yeah, you deserve it. Uh, this is evident. Then, if you have time, if it's convenient for you, worry about others' needs, right? Then, maybe... Maybe, or maybe not entirely, you squeeze in God, right? In matching your guys' theme for this year, we are called to be what? What is your theme? Different. different. We must be different than the world's view of me first, which we see in these. We are called and shown to live the exact reverse of what the world teaches. God always comes first, then others, then us. So why do I say that? Well, because that is how the Bible teaches it, right? This is the word of God. We believe that these are the direct words of God to our lives. So let's look at our scriptural proof of why that is the case. Don't just believe me. So let's start with Philippians, which I already read, uh, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. It says, Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not only for their own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's pretty clear. That's pretty black and white. Consider others as more important than yourselves. Not, not too hard to mess that one up. Let's look at some other ones here. Galatians 6, 2. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. By the way, guys, you can't carry someone else's burden if you're too focused on your own burden. Carry one another's burdens. Let's look at another one. Romans 12, 10. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. All these passages 
are very clear in the command to put others first, right? Other people first. Are you guys seeing what I'm putting down here? Those verses talk about other people sharing burdens, right? So let's look at the top of the list. Let's look at the verses that prove why God should be first. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Here's another one in Matthew. This is uh, Matthew chapter 22. Math, or, uh, Jesus here is talking to the Sadducees, uh, the religious leaders. He said, he, Jesus, said to them, who's the Sadducees, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. As we can see pretty clearly here, the Bible paints this picture. It paints this picture of God first, right? In our hearts, which is our attitude, in our minds, right? In our thoughts. And then, like we see in Philippians 2, 3 through 4, we must consider others as more important than ourselves. Then comes you. This should be our mentality. When you think of the big bad villains in the Bible, who comes to mind? Give me some ideas. Who, who comes to mind when you think of, like, someone who is against? Yeah. You said enemy, right? Yeah, villains, yeah. Okay, the devil. Okay, there's a good one, yep. Goliath. Okay, Goliath, yep, way back in the back. Yeah. Pharaoh, that's a great one. Yep, Carson. Oh, I get the Bible? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. There's a bunch of them. How about Herod? Jezebel, right? You said Pharaoh. That was a good one. But the one that I want to focus on, listen up, guys. The one that I want to focus on was actually the first one we said. It's Satan, right? He's the biggest, the biggest villain in the entire Bible, right? Let's see. Let's see how Satan's story started. Let's look at the example of Satan and how his pride impacted his story. So in Isaiah 14, 13 through 15, we can see the very first thoughts of Satan after he rebelled against God. Isaiah writes, and this is Satan speaking, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But, here's God's response, you will be brought down to Sheol into the deepest regions of the pit. Okay, there's a lot in there, but what I want you guys to pick up is the pride in his words, and I want you to notice the eyes in the text, right? I will ascend. I will set up my throne above God. I will. I, I. He repeats it over and over again. Satan is clearly putting himself first. Is it any wonder that Satan wants the world to convince you of the same? He wants you to look at yourselves as first. I want you guys to see that when we choose our pride over our pride and our sin over humility, we are actually siding with Satan. When you choose to disobey your parents because, you know, you know better, right? We all thought that. I've thought that. When you put yourself first, when you choose others over yourself, when your pride takes over, you are really saying, I'm siding with Satan, but look down at the end again where, it's, where God responds. But you will be brought down. God brought him down after all of his talk of ascending. He talked about, I should probably put it up, there it is. Put it on this. He talked about going up. He talked about ascending, Satan did. But God said, I will bring you down. Do you see the polar opposites here? We're going to be talking about polar opposites a bunch in this text, so get ready. Here's another one. Who can tell me what an antithesis is? Anybody know? Nobody knows what antithesis is. It's kind of a funny word. Okay, I'll give it to you. An antithesis, I just mentioned it, is a person or a thing that is a direct opposite of someone or something else. So who is the antithesis of Satan? God, Jesus, right? Sunday school answer, good one. So let's look at our text again in Philippians 2. We can see what Jesus' response was to all of this. So starting in verse 7, instead, Jesus, he emptied himself, he became low, right, from what he deserved, by assuming the form of a slave, talk about low prestige here, taking on the likeness of men, 
men being sinful, imperfect humankind. And when he came as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Guys, do you realize how far of a stoop this is for Jesus? This is the creator of the world, right? The creator of earth, the creator of, bigger than that, our whole universe, right? He created everything from the atoms that make up the cells of your body to galaxies. Every star was placed by his hand, right? Psalm 147.4 says, He counts the number of stars. He gives names to all of them. That's incredible. Jesus had every right to come to earth as the king above every other. He had every right to come to earth and reign supreme, putting himself on the top of the human throne. He had every right. He had every right to show off his unmeasurable glory. But what does he do? Verse 6, he says, Jesus, who existing in the form of God, meaning equal to God, right, did not consider equality to be something to be used to his advantage. The ESV version says, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, some of you hopefully notice this is actually the exact passage that Pastor Pat used on Sunday morning. So if you're there on Sunday morning, you might have heard Pastor use this, Ephesian, or this uh, Philippians passage. So for those, of, for those of you who weren't here, let me give you a summary of what Pastor said. He said, we're talking about Jesus, referring to Jesus. He said, you don't grasp at something you already have, right? Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped because he already had it. Jesus is God, right? This passage is showing God's undiminished divinity. But something did change here, right? We see it. Pastor Pat also said that Jesus, at his incarnation, didn't become less than God. He became more than God. He became the God-man, right? You might ask, how can Christ, that's kind of a confusing sentence, but you might ask how Christ can become more than God. Well, because God isn't man, right? Do you remember this illustration? God took perfect humanity, and on this side, he took undiminished deity, and he mixed them together. He took his, his divinity and added to it perfect humanity. But Christ, the God-man, did not see his equality to God, something to be used, to be grasped, to be held above others. Instead, he emptied himself and became a lowly human. I don't know about you guys, but the lowest form, the humblest form that I can think of is a baby, right? Christ could have and deserved to have come as the highest of kings seated on the highest throne. Christ, with his undiminished deity, deserves all the glory. But instead, he chose to come as the antithesis, as the opposite of high, right? He chose to come at the lowest as a baby. And not only at the lowest, but the lowest who couldn't even get a room at the inn. The lowest who was surrounded by animals and was laid in an animal's food trough for a bed. Guys, you can't get more humble than that. The creator of the world chose a food trough. Now, let's look at God's response to all this. Therefore, for this reason, because of Jesus' action of humility and putting himself lower than he deserves, verse 9, God highly exalted him and made him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you remember our conversation about on Satan? I will ascend, right? I will rise above the stars, but God said, you will be brought down. The opposite's there. The antithesis, Jesus, who humbled himself and brought himself down, emptied himself, and what does God do? Exalts, raises him up, holds him up, right? Lifts up his name. In verse 11, at the very end, we can see in that last line, it says, to the glory of God the Father. As a direct result of Jesus Humbling himself, God is being glorified. And you know what? The same is true for you and me. When we humble ourselves, like Christ did, 
we also bring glory to God. And since that is really our purpose while we are here on earth, is to glorify God, I'd say that humility is probably a pretty good place to start, right? Do you guys know that four times in Scripture, in the books of Matthew and Luke, Jesus specifically said, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Four times. When there's repetition like that, just like the I wills of Satan, we need to pay attention to that in the Word. In Matthew 18, that first one up there, Jesus follows that quote by saying this. He says, this one, meaning this person, whoever does this, right? This one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's a reward if I've ever heard it, right? So let's do a quick review. We have seen Satan and his pride, his desire to rise above God by putting himself first. We can see why he wants us to think the same as he does. Because when we do, we are siding with him rather than Jesus. But the opposite thinking, the antithesis, remember, is that attitude and mindset of Christ Jesus. Jesus, fully God and fully perfect man, divine in every way, but not clinging to his divinity, his attitude, his mindset was to humble himself, becoming low, to die on a cross for you and for me, so that at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you guys see this trajectory difference? You guys know what trajectories are? Jesus versus Satan, right? Satan raising himself up for a short time and being eternally put down, humbled, right? Brought down, that's what the Bible says. And then you have Jesus who lowered himself for a short time, being exalted for all eternity. Who are you going to side with? What is your trajectory going to be? If you've never humbled yourself and trusted Jesus as your Savior, this is a great place to start. Humility is the first step of coming into a relationship with him. Recognize what Christ did for you personally. He stooped to our level even when he didn't have to. He didn't need to. He was fully divine, but because of his immeasurable love for you personally and for me, he did. Humble yourself and realize that nothing we have done is of any value to getting us to heaven, right? Nothing we have done gets us anywhere. The only way we are to live forever with him is to believe that he did go to the cross, right? To bear our sins and our shame. And he died carrying our burdens so that we could be wiped clean and be able to reside in heaven with our creator eternally. If you have any questions, guys, that's why I'm here. That's why Jared's normally here. That's why Alyssa's here. That's why your leaders are here. Please talk to us. This is why you're here. This is why we're here. We want you to come to talk to us. So what? So why did Jesus come? That's the big question, right? So here we go. Jesus came to show us by example how to live humbly. And if we want to be more like Jesus, we must. We must live humbly. We can summarize. So verse 5 through 11 in our, in our text is known as the hymn of Christ. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is known as the hymn of Christ. And we can summarize the hymn of Christ as this. Jesus, his mindset, which we see in verse 6, led to action, which we see in verse 7, which led to his destiny, which we see in verse 8, which resulted in his reward, verses 9 through 11. Let me say that again. His mindset in verse 6, not considering his equality something to be grasped, right, led to his action, humbling himself, taking the form of a slave, taking the form of man, right, which led to his destiny, to the point of death, even to death on a cross, which resulted in his reward, right? For this reason, God highly exalted him. This sounds much better. I like this version way more better, or way better than that of Satan's, whose mindset was pride, right? Pride, and to raise himself up. That was his mindset. His action was to rebel against God, 
and his destiny was to be cast down and humbled. And by the way, there's no reward there. No reward. So listen closely. My challenge for you guys is hidden pretty clearly in, this, in plain sight in the command of verse 5. We've kind of looked at all the other verses. Now I want to backtrack and look at verse 5, okay? This is what I want you to take away from this message. Are you guys listening to this? Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. That's it. This is the starting point, right? If you guys get this, it'll take you far. Your mindset will lead to your action, which will lead to your destiny, which the Bible tells us can be suffering and will be suffering, right? Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. Granted meaning it is a gift, right? It is a gift for us to suffer for him. And we will suffer, which will lead to our reward and eternal and eternally glorifying God, right? We are not only to put God first, we are to put ourselves last. I'll wrap up with this illustration. <clears throat> there used to be a famous boxer uh, who was named George Foreman. Now, a lot of you might know George Foreman as a grill. That's not what I'm talking about. It is, the, it is the same George Foreman, but that's not what I'm talking about. George Foreman, who competed in the late 60s uh, all the way actually to the 90s. That's a pretty long career for boxing. He was a two-time heavyweight champion of the world, gold medalist in the 68 Olympics, had a career record of 76 and 5. It's pretty good. He's a big deal. This guy's a big deal. He's an incredible boxer, right? So in 1973, early in his career, Foreman was undefeated with a record of 37 and 0 and was set to challenge Joe Frazier, the reigning world champion for the heavyweight title. But uh, Foreman was actually still an underdog because Joe Frazier was also undefeated and the reigning champion. So after an electric fight known as the Sundown Showdown, Foreman went on to knock out Joe Frazier to win his very first title fight. About a year and a half later, after he successfully defended two title fights and was still undefeated, Foreman came up against another challenger. You might recognize the name, Muhammad Ali. Yes, now, yes, Muhammad Ali, at this point in his career, was old. He didn't really, wasn't really in his prime in the 60s or in the 70s. So Ali was not supposed to win this fight. Foreman was still the favorite. But after an incredible fight, known as the Rumble in the Jungle, Ali wore down Foreman, and for the first time in Foreman's career, Ali was able to knock him out, overtaking him in an iconic fight. And here's the picture from that fight. So, this is, this is Ali standing over Foreman there in that picture. So most athletes, most athletes like to reminisce on their victories. You guys in any sporting event, band, choir, anything like that, I almost guarantee you that almost all of you are, right? Yeah. So you're all going for this first place thing, right? You're all going for, I want first place in my band competition. I want first place in my sporting event. We can all understand that. That's what trophy cases are for, right? That's why we get trophy cases. We put our trophies in them. We want to show them off. If you get something shiny, you want to show it off, right? And I guarantee you the foreman had a lot of victories. But many years later, after foreman retired from boxing, someone saw the screensaver of Foreman's computer. They were confused when they saw this image. So why would a guy who has two heavyweight title fights is a gold medalist choose this picture, his, his defeat, to be his screensaver? So they asked him, and he said simply, it's a reminder every day that you have to keep humble. George Foreman clearly understood the value of humbling himself. He understood the value of living different and unlike the world. Do you? Christ put himself lower than he deserved, assuming the form of a slave, of a baby. What have you or I done that deserves any glory? And the answer is nothing. We haven't done anything. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus and humble yourself like Jesus did. Thanks, guys. Yeah.